Hi, can I help you? Yeah, can I discover God, please? Oh, hi, Amy, I didn't know it was you. Here you go, that's me. How much is it? That'll be $69. Here you go, keep the change. Hi, doggy, you're my favorite customer. Thanks a lot, bye, Bye bye If you know what that movie's from, then kudos to you. But anyways, hey, welcome back to Amygdala Vids, and as always, you look fantastic. So today we're gonna be talking about the big man in the sky, capital G-O-D. But we should probably make sure we're on the same page here, cause this video probably won't be for everyone. Full disclosure, I'm an agnostic who's open to the idea of God. In fact, if we think about a pro-con list for believing in God, I personally find that there's more happening on the pro side. But hey, that's just me. We all value things differently, and you could see believing in God as having negative consequences. I'm not gonna go into specifics as to why I think believing in God has more practical benefits than not, cause that's a whole video. Hell, that's a whole series. Bottom line is that I'm coming at this from an agnostic perspective who's open to God. Problem is, faith isn't just some light switch where you could just believe and not believe at any time. And I get it, I get it. If you grew up in the church, you may think I'm just being stubborn. And if you're a hardcore atheist, you may think I'm a fucking idiot. But guess what? I also think I'm a fucking idiot. And how can I, a stupid human being, possibly comprehend the existence of a divine figure? I've read the Bible, gone to Bible study groups, even listened to Darth Vader do an audiobook for the Book of Luke. But it's just not happening for me, I know. Let me know if anyone out there is in a similar situation, where you're agnostic but recognize some benefits for believing in God, and yet you can't just get yourself to say that you believe. But thankfully, the Danish philosopher Soren Kierkegaard is coming in clutch. Now let me know if this story sounds familiar. You discover Kierkegaard through some general accessible philosophy source, and you're like, hey, that sounds like a cool person to read. But then you open up Sickness Unto Death, and you're turned off. It's just not a fun read, despite the nuggets of insight that you could dig out after you get past all the irony and complicated writing. But guys, this book by Kierkegaard that I'm going to be reading from is top tier when it comes to enjoyment, accessibility, and practicality. It's poetic without being obscure. It's short while also being packed with insight. It's just beautiful. I'm fangirling over this book and I highly, highly suggest you read it. If Eternalized Philosophy doesn't do a video on this book, then I'm deleting my entire channel. But what is this book? Well, it's got a big ass title. It's called The Lily of the Field and the Bird of the Air, also known as the Three Godly Discourses. These three godly discourses focus on, as the title states, the birds and the lilies. And these three godly discourses specifically are stated as such. We might from the lily and the bird learn silence, obedience, joy. This video which concerns finding God is going to be focusing only on the first discourse which concerns silence. Now for Kierkegaard, finding God, or as he puts it, seeking God's kingdom, is going to be our first step here. After all, what sense does it make to spread the word of a God you haven't fully discovered yet? And what, in a very general sense, should we do to discover this God? Kierkegaard states, From the lily and the bird as teachers, let us learn silence, or learn to keep silent. You shall in the deepest sense make yourself nothing. Become nothing before God. Learn to keep silent. In the silence is the beginning which is first to seek God's kingdom. Alright, you're thinking, I guess I just gotta shut the hell up and find God then. Well, it's complicated. It's pretty vague what Kierkegaard means by silence. So let's try and get a list of considerations up as to what he could mean by silence. Now as the last quote shows, an aspect of the silence is to make yourself nothing. So we'll put that up on our board first. Now another consideration, or perhaps this speaks to the first consideration, is to rid yourself of desire as well. In this silence, the many thoughts of wishing and desiring fall silent in the fear of God. In this silence, the loquacity of thanksgiving falls silent in the fear of God. So now on our little consideration board here, we have making yourself nothing and not desiring. I kind of see these two going hand in hand, you know? But I'm still a little unsure of what Kierkegaard means by become nothing. So let me know your thoughts about these first two considerations in the comments below. Now another consideration I picked up is to listen. You know, prayer we usually think of as a one-way communication to God. But from what I get from this passage, it could be two-way. He had thought that to pray was to talk. He learned that to pray is not only to keep silent, but to listen. And that is how it is. To pray is not to listen to oneself speak, but is to come to keep silent, and to continue keeping silent. To wait until the person who prays hears God. So although Kierkegaard kinda differentiates silence and listening in that quote, for our purposes I think it'd be helpful to add it to our consideration board. 
Just as a reminder that when we're in silence, we should be open and listening for God. Now the next consideration deals with humanity and the human world. And he longs to be out in that solemn silence, away from the worldliness of the human world, where there is so much talk away from all the worldly life of humanity, which merely demonstrates in a sorry way that it is speech that distinguishes human beings from animals. So I think this quote is asking us to consider what this human world is. My interpretation is that it's speaking to worldly concerns. You know, am I gonna be late for my appointment? What should I make for dinner? Oh man, Infinity Sin is so cool, I wish I could be like him. Those sort of concerns. Perhaps in this silent state we should let go of the human world and its concerns. All except for the last concern, obviously. Now as the list grows, you've probably still been thinking about silence like actual silence. If that were the case, let's just lock ourselves in those quiet rooms where people apparently go insane. But it's not necessarily a general absence of audio that this silence is. As Kierkegaard writes, There is silence out there. The forest keeps silent. Even when it whispers, it is nonetheless silent. The sea keeps silent. Even when it rages loudly, it is nonetheless silent. When the silence of evening descends upon the countryside and you hear the distant lowing of cattle from the meadow, or you hear the familiar voice of the dog from the farmer's house, it cannot be said that this lowing of the dog's voice disturbs the silence. No, this is part of the silence. It has a secret, and thus a silent understanding with the silence. It increases it. So it seems like the sounds of nature get a pass, but not the sounds of humans. And why is this? Do us humans really sound so ugly? Well, let's use the bird and the lily as our teachers to find out why. The bird keeps silent and waits. It knows, or rather it fully and firmly believes, that everything takes place at its appointed time. Therefore, the bird waits. But it knows that it is not granted to it to know the hour or the day. Therefore, it keeps silent. Maybe there's something going on with patience, or maybe this is more about things in nature conforming to God's will, which is touched on in the second discourse. Either way, perhaps in order to experience this silence, we should go out in nature since their sounds seem to be okay. Kierkegaard then starts talking about this moment, which might be in reference to the moment you could find God. When one speaks, even if one says only a single word, one misses the moment. Only in silence is the moment. He cannot keep silent and wait. This perhaps explains why the moment never comes for him at all. He cannot keep silent. This explains why he did not notice the moment when it came for him. One important thing to take away from this is to wait. Be patient with this moment. You know, don't just give it 30 seconds, and perhaps if you are concerned about time, you're not letting go of your desires. But okay, okay, we got all these considerations about what this silent state is that we should be in, but what exactly are we looking for? Is God gonna come down in a physical form, crack open a beer for the both of you, and talk about the mysteries of life? Probably not. Unfortunately, there's not a lot written about what this moment is except for this important piece. No matter how significant it is in itself, does the moment come with commotion or shouting? No, it comes softly, on lighter feet than the lightest tread of any creature, for it comes with the light step of the sudden. It comes stealthily. Therefore, one must be utterly silent if one is to perceive that now it is here, and at the next moment it is gone. So this moment is subtle, quiet, almost unnoticeable. But what I'm hoping for as a skeptical agnostic is that even if this moment is minuscule, it's powerful enough to wash away all doubts. Maybe I'm asking for too much, I don't know. I want to finish off quoting with these two final passages to sort of put the cherry on top of this religious Sunday, so to speak. And this is surely the misfortune in the lives of many, of far the greater part of humanity, that they never perceive the moment, that in their lives the eternal and the temporal were exclusively separated. And why? Because they could not keep silent. Seek first God's kingdom, that is, become like the lily and the bird, that is, become utterly silent before God, then all the rest will be added unto you. And that's it. I know I repeat this often, but I am more of a student than a teacher of philosophy, so I'd be interested in your guys' thoughts on any of this. Any of the considerations, any of the quotes, anything. When I get an opportunity, I'll drive out into nature, some secluded spot, and give this a shot. I'd also like to add, though, that you shouldn't go into this with some confirmation bias or anything like that. Maintain your skepticism, but just be open. Don't force something to be the moment, but rather let the moment reveal itself to you. That's what I'm going to do anyways. And that does it for this video. If you enjoyed it, do me a favor and hit that subscribe, like, and bell button. I'd really appreciate it. Let me know if you're interested in me going over the other dialogues in this book. 
The second one is about obedience, and I kinda disagree with Kierkegaard a bit in this one. But the last one, oh my god. The last discourse was the best Christian response to our existential dilemma I ever read personally. Or suggest something else if you hated all of this. Anyways, I'll see you then and I wish you all a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you.